The Day of Atonement. Lesson 15. Don't Delay. Well, last time we talked about the concept of choosing righteousness. Basically, it is required that a Christian conduct himself according to his judgment. The Christian life is not characterized by somehow discovering what it is that God wants. And, you know, he pulls a string and we, and, and we follow him like a puppet. Uh, and this actually is uh, better understood in the light of the Feast of uh, Trumpets. But rather, he expects you to understand what is before you. Understand the scriptures. Understand him and make the right choice when there are choices placed before you. But a lot of times choices are not placed before you. We had no choice concerning our parents, uh, concerning our talents. Uh, you, we have very little to say. Uh, one can just not, you just can't be president of the United States, say, just because you want to. It's, it's, it's just simply is not available. Uh, but there are things that are placed before you where you can make your choices. And that is a very important part of redemption because the way in which you make your choices then becomes deciding factors that lead you in, uh, in your serving the Lord. And uh, we saw how the Lord says, I set before you life and good and death and evil. Choose. And how Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In other words, how long halt ye between two opinions? You know, what uh, the Lord requires us to make up our mind and to act accordingly. And we are led astray because we choose, either we refuse to choose, which is passivity, or we choose to gratify ourselves, or we choose to be like the world, or we choose to entertain sin, and thereby disannulling the Day of Atonement. Being able to make choices is required, God, and God will teach you. It's not as though he sets these choices before you and then leaves you helpless and says, come on now, you figure it out. He does not do that. But he coaches and trains and teaches and leads. And, and um, as any great teacher does, uh, uh, even in the midst of our mistakes, he's not, um, he's not all that uh, uh, confounded when we make mistakes. He, everything's with, with the Lord is always in poise. He knows what he's doing. And so, <clears throat> choosing righteousness is an important ingredient, and it has to do with your participation in the judgment of God. It has to do with your assessment that God's ways are just, and they are worthy to be walked in, and you demonstrate that by choosing that above other things. And remember, we saw how Moses, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. He, he made that choice. God didn't come to him and say, now Moses, this is what you have to do. He did later. But Moses just simply had it in his heart. He saw the alternatives. And even though the one put him at a tremendous disadvantage, that he chose. And that's a very... Uh, rich component of, uh, of overcoming sin and standing righteously before the Lord. He does much, but there are also requirements he places on us too. So avoid passivity. It's better, it's better to make, sometimes it's better to make a bad choice than to allow your Christian life to be one where you are continually overtaken by events, where you, you, you take your cues from what is happening to you. And you can't take your cues by what's happening to you because you, know, you may be surrounded with the, with the hordes of hell. 
And so your circumstances are not going to be friendly at all. Any questions on that? Choosing righteousness. <clears throat> Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed. The last component that I felt to uh, emphasize has to do, again, with something that we are, it's a component that we are required to address. And that is that when God has made things clear to us, he doesn't expect us to postpone our choices. It's like now is when we are to act. And one temptation, one great temptation, is to figure, I just need more time to figure this out. Or uh, surely this can wait for another time. Or maybe, uh, maybe I'm about to make a mistake and so uh, maybe I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't push it. And all these things uh, can be wise. Uh, sometimes Satan pressures you in making a decision, and it's wise to kind of stand off and say, "Well, I think I'll, I think I'll see this one through." And like so many things in the Christian life, it's more a matter of learning when it is appropriate, rather than trying to argue whether it is ever appropriate. So there's, there's a time when it is really best to wait and see. Sometimes you have circumstances that are unclear and they, they clarify themselves because a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. And sometimes like the wheat and the tares, they're growing together and you're just not all that sure. And so there's a place for that. But not in the circumstances that I am describing. What I am describing is that God does call for action right away when he has explained sufficiently and that we don't like about the Lord we, we we would rather have him say well Lord just explain this to me again you know just kind of sing me the same song and what uh, what I want to convey to you uh, why don't we begin with the 119th Psalm <clears throat> and this is one of the aspects that kind of keeps the pressure on because here is a distinct barb in the Christian life. I mean, this, this business that I want to describe to you is no fun. But let me summarize it and then, and then we'll look at some scriptures. God is patient, but not infinitely so. See, if you're infinitely patient, you're being careless. See, that says that in, in the long haul, it really doesn't matter. That's indifference. That's not, that's not patience. That's indifference. And the problem is that there comes a point when God decides, hey, that, this is enough. Enough. And he draws a line. And he says, you go over that line... And things are different. It's something that he does. And it would be great if we could see it all spelled out really clearly in the scriptures so that we would, we would know uh, kind of uh, by recipe when these things happen. But you can't. Sometimes a relationship goes too far. And God draws the line and he says, no more. And he never said that to you before. It was always, always kind of, it was just okay. He didn't seem to mind uh, maybe there's some annoying things that kind of troubled you, and you, you made it a matter of prayer, and then God speaks, and he draws a line. And so ignoring that line or pretending that it doesn't exist is, is actually very treacherous because when the line is drawn, it's drawn. And one of the things that reduces our sensitivity to the presence of the line and the need to act is the feeling, well, maybe I can wait it out. In other words, procrastinating, just simply delaying and not attending to uh, what needs to be attended to. 
I don't know. I, sometimes as you, as you grow in the Lord, you begin to learn how He signals you to be careful. And most of the time, it's just a very gentle prompting. It's no handwriting on the wall or a clap of thunder. Usually it's just the faintest of suggestions, be careful here. And of course what we do, we just go crashing through because we figured, uh, what did that mean? And then we find ourselves faced with a class A problem. Well, what happens is that you begin to learn to start paying attention that when the Lord sows caution in your spirit, that you take that as a, as a signal that the Lord is addressing your attention concerning a, uh, another matter. I had a, um, a direct experience with that. Um, uh, when I first uh, came to know the Lord, I was, I was driving a car down one of the California freeways, and I... Uh, it was kind of regular uh, morning traffic, and so I was accelerating and decelerating, putting, uh, changing lanes. And um, at one point, when I put my foot on the brakes, there was an ever so slight sensation that it wasn't quite right. The brakes worked. I wasn't experiencing any kind of problem, but it just wasn't like it always is. But it wasn't devastating. And I chose to ignore it. Well, what happened, and the Lord was just super great, when it came time for my exit and, uh, and I needed to slow down, I put my foot, the brake went all the way to the floor without slowing the car at all. I mean, those brakes were gone. So the Lord, uh, the Lord helped, and uh, uh, I was able to uh, negotiate the car safely and actually uh, rolled right into a... Uh, right into a gas station. So, uh, but a short time after that, he chose to make that an object lesson. He says, you ignored some evidence there. You didn't check it out. You figured, ah, if it's a real problem, it's going to happen again. I'll get another warning. I'll get another shot at this. And he said, not so. Not so. When I speak to you, I want you to check it out. You know how it is with your children? It, does it irk you as a parent that you have to say something two or three times to your children? Well, that's how we can get to be with the Lord. And what kind of a relationship is that? Where the Lord says, do this, do that, and you know, tell me again, Lord. You know, just want to be sure that it's you. Well, if you don't know who it is that you're serving, it seems to me that we need to work on that relationship so that the sheep knows the master's voice, but that's, a, that's another matter. So that basically is the problem. And there are a number of things that entices us into delaying, and we want to we wanna look at that as well as see how the scriptures uh, uh, urge us not to do so, as well as I want to see if I can characterize this concept that God himself draws the line and there it sits and it either gets crossed or it doesn't and it's it's a side of the Lord we don't like to hear it's kind of like uh, when a parent makes up their mind you know Johnny one more time and that's it and Johnny figures well I've had it's been one more time all night <laughs> you know only this time it's so well, okay, well, let's look at this. 119th Psalm, uh, way down around the 57th verse. <clears throat> you are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. Have you said that? I hope you have. That's not presumptuous to say that. It delights the Lord. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. See, that's, uh, that's choosing righteousness. I made haste and delayed not to keep your commandments. When you know what to do, do it. Because if you delay... What will happen spiritually, 
in the spiritual realm, they're going to come standing one after another with reasons why it is that it really wasn't God's will or it's just as well to do something differently. Once the thing has been made clear to you, once you understand what it is that is God's will, do it. Do not tempt God. Do not be presumptuous or foolish by asking, Lord, let's have one more go around here. Now, if you lack wisdom, God's faithful. Ask, and he will grant you wisdom. But we're not talking about the case where things aren't clear. We're talking about where God has made it clear. This is a different case. Don't delay. If you see something is sin, deal with it immediately. Say, now, Lord, I lied today. I mean, it was bald, and I did it. And I, I am addressing this before your very throne, and I'm not going to let this thing linger. One thing you learn in overcoming sin and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and the world and the flesh and the devil and all the rest is to keep short accounts with God. Don't try to see what your credit line is <laughs> when he finally makes a margin call or something. Don't do that. Keep your accounts really short. I mean, try not to use your credit at all. Just keep your account clean. And when something isn't right, get it taken care of right away. I think you know how it is maybe in, uh, maybe in your business or at home. Um, you know, there's, there's a certain length of time that if you don't mow the lawn, it's just a problem. I mean, it becomes a nightmare. And it really is better to keep up with the work. And it's the same with the Lord. To keep up with him as he leads and guides, and especially as he begins to reveal the areas where he is taking issue with, especially when you see what it is that he is desiring of you. Don't add insult to injury, as they say, by postponing your action. Once you've made up your mind what the commandment of God is, then make haste and don't delay to keep his commandments. Satan is a master at reasoning. He is a disputer. Uh, one of my favorite, um, there are two uh, uh, stories by C.S. Lewis, and they are, they are much the same. One is uh, more for children, so you might want to start with that one. Um, it's called uh, The Silver Chair. And in that, the, the person who is uh, symbolic of Satan does a masterful job in persuading this individual who lives underground that there is no sunshine. In fact, there isn't, there isn't even anything called the sun. It doesn't exist. And this person knows that there is, but the logic, the cunning in which, in which they are talked out of it is, a, is an absolute masterpiece. Uh, and I think it's a good portrayal of, of what Satan is able to do. The second book, which is far more adult, written by the same author, C.S. Lewis, is called um, Paralandra, and it's the second of his, um, of his, trilo of his space trilogy. And, uh, and there it's the same thing. There it's, uh, it's Eve, who's pure and righteous and holy and uh, wants to serve her husband and wants to serve God and this... This guy comes along and through chit-chat and talk, and, you know, the issue is to disobey her husband. And just, just the way he uses logic and, and deceit and treachery, he takes this very pure, uh, very innocent mind and begins to bend it. Praise the Lord. It's, he's a master at deceit. And so when things have, when, when, as you're following the Lord, and the Lord has brought things to clarity, that's the time to act. When things are clear to you, and you feel this confidence, you feel this assurance that you have the mind of God, and you have the word of God, and it needs to be done, don't postpone it. You are asking for needless trouble, needless trouble. And for the delay of an interval of time, you may buy yourself um, ten times that same interval of time in trying to back your way uh, out of it. <clears throat> and it can be fatal. Uh, 
Let's look at Ecclesiastes 11.3. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. If the clouds, this is Ecclesiastes 11.3. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall be. Now, this scripture can invite exaggeration. <coughs> but let me give you the sense of it as I feel. It's conveying a sense that in in things of the spirit, there are some things that just simply are. And what happens, happens, and that's it. And there's nothing more to be said. It is because that's what it is. Now, we don't like that because we like the idea of another chance. And God amply provides. He's, remember, we saw how the goodness of God... His patience, his forbearance leads us to repentance. But we need to know that there is this other aspect too, and that is God says, well, that's where the tree fell, that's where it stays. It is what it is, because it did what it did, and that's it. And this, in New Testament terms, is reminiscent of do not be deceived. God is not mocked. This is Galatians. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. That's another, that's a similar one. In other words, what you do is what you get. The way you behave is the way you're rewarded. What you sow, what you plant is what you, re is what you reap. If you are merciless, you receive no mercy. If you will not forgive, you are not forgiven. And we don't like that. And... One of the things that prompts us to obeying the Lord in a timely way is the knowledge or the sensitivity that we don't want him to say, well, there they are. That's where they are. That's where they are. Because there is that. You want the Lord to... Be persuaded at all times that, that mistakes are redeemable, that you're given it your best shot, and that though your behavior may not be uh, what it needs to be, your heart is fervent after him. And that's what makes David a man after God's heart. And Saul such a thing to God he hated Saul he was chosen by God but God just ended up despising him Saul bumbled he he didn't he it's almost like he didn't do anything right you know Samuel said what's what's this bleating what's this baying that what I what, what are these animals I'm hearing and Saul had this really rational excuse say that's the tr that tree fell and God figured, well, that's, this, is, this is what I have. Because it's manifest. Whatsoever doth make manifest, that is light. And you don't want to nudge up against that side of the Lord. You don't want to extend your credit rating to such a degree that God begins to step back and take a longer look and say, well, you know, I wonder if they even really want to change. They're despising my grace. I wonder if they really mean business. You don't want that question to come up in God's mind. You want, you want rather God kind of chuckling and say, well, you know, wow, they, uh, they missed that one, didn't they? Well, angels, well, let's see if we can't make it plainer for them. Let's see if we can't help them this way. Well, I don't... Why don't we see if we can give them a good word this Sunday in church and kind of, you know, give them a shot in the arm? That's usually how God responds, but not always, because he's a careful evaluator. He's always searching and probing. 
And there comes a time, there is a place where he finds coldness and he'll say, look, I have nothing more to say here. I have nothing more to do. And what is just simply is. Let's look at Matthew 24. <clears throat> and it's so needless, isn't it? He's so marvelous. And he provides all that's needed. But we do need to know that we can be careless. Matthew 24, uh, verse 43. You say, well, this doesn't apply to the servants of the Lord. No. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Be you... Therefore, be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. And then he begins to explain some more. Who then is a faithful and wise servant over whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. I like that. Because that implies we kind of have God characterized as this, this great universal mind that kind of exists and kind of sees all and knows all, which is almost a, an Eastern mystical concept. That's not God does, God is all powerful. He is omnipotent. But he is also characterized in the scriptures as one who likes to see. He likes to find out for himself. Remember he said to um, Abraham concerning uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, now I've heard it's bad down there, and I'm going to go to see if it's as bad as I hear. There's something about the Lord. He, he likes to come himself and find out what's happening, rather than being this universal kind of mind that's kind of is aware you know, he's much more of a person than that. That's a, that's a metaphysical Eastern kind of a thing. And so the idea is, when Jesus comes, how will he find you? It's very important. If he finds you doing, then, verily I say to you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. See, the servant of the Lord, we know Jesus has delayed his coming. And it's also plain from the scriptures, from Matthew 24 and elsewhere, uh, that right from the start he planned to delay his coming. So what then do we do as the servant? The good servant says, well, I'm going to get to and get my job done. The unwise servant says, well, you know, I can, uh, I've got an angle here. I mean, I know he's not coming, so I can make things kind of go my way. And that's what he does. He begins to smite his fellow servants and to, servants and to eat and, uh, and drink with the drunken. But what happens when you delay it's kind of like the tortoise and the hare. Remember, the, the, the rabbit was way ahead. I mean, just could have one hands down. But what did he do? He stopped. he stopped and he fell asleep. And what happened was he was overtaken. Without knowing, he was overtaken. And that's what happens when you figure... Well, I've got time. I can, I can kind of work this thing out. All of a sudden, you blind a part of you. And then when Jesus comes, it's like, Ugh, I forgot. He's here already. And that's why the delay brings jeopardy. It, it tends to blind a part of us that's sensitive to what it is that the Lord's doing. We figure... 
hey, I've, I've got this. I've got latitude here. I can work the moves. And this guy began to act uh, rudely. He's, this isn't someone who's acting uh, as though he's being reconciled to the Lord. And what happens is that all of a sudden, he crosses a line, and there's Jesus. See, there's no more time to make up for the past. See, there, there's a place where delay is just too long, and, it cro and a line crosses into it, and the tree has fallen. And Jesus says, where is this tree? Oh, it fell to the north. So, Jesus has an expectation. See, he sets the expectation. And when he shows up, he responds based on what he finds. And you can see how devastating delay is. And so that's why, even though we think we may have a, a, a million years, or a generation, or even our own lifetime, we still attend to everything at hand post haste. We just, with alacrity and liveliness and, and diligence, when we have chosen to follow the commandments of God, we do so right away because there is no need to delay. If, once, you've, once you've made up your mind what your course shall be, why make it up again? Once you've given your best judgment as to what should be done, why start all over again? Give it your best shot. Don't delay. And this becomes all the more severe when you have all the more clarity in the Lord. Let's look at a few, uh, a few more. Luke uh, chapter 12, down around um, verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room wherein to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. See, this man's making choices. The problem is, there is a... God has drawn a line for this man. And that line is coming closer. And what happens is this man is approaching this line completely oblivious to it. God has chosen the line, but this man is oblivious. And so he's doing all kinds of things, good, prudent things to do. He's managing his affairs very well. Except that he has postponed attending to things that were much more important. So the line that was drawn here is simply the number of days of his life here on earth. See, David said, Lord, teach us to number our days. And you and I have one less than we had yesterday. It's one less. Subtract one. If you hadn't done it yet, subtract one. Say, that is sure. It is sure. We act like, no, it's not. Yes, it is. So, verse 19 and I will say to my soul, soul, you have made much goods laid up for you for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, you're a fool. This night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose shall those things be which you have provided? So it is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. God gives us ample of whatever is needed to be fully reconciled to him. If it's wisdom, wisdom is present. If it's mercy, mercy is present. If it's power and strength or authority, all these things are present. But we cannot neglect all that God has given and especially when things have come to be clear enough to us that God realistically expects, as only his judgment can, now, like it says, what is it, 2 Corinthians 9, now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was readiness to will, let there now be a performance out of that which you have. 
There comes a time when God says, maybe, maybe we ought to look at that. There comes a time when God says, well, you've been willing, and this willingness is really great. Now let's see some do. And just as you are really energetic in being willing, I want to see you energetic in actually doing. Did you know God talks that way? Well, let's, let's try to find that. It uh, just came to my mind. That's 2 Corinthians 8 or 2 Corinthians 9. Good verse. Real good verse, because sometimes God will talk to you this way. <clears throat> you need to know it's in the Bible. 8.11, <clears throat> thank you. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. There comes a time when the Lord says, okay, I've taught, I've trained, I've counseled, we've been through this, and now you're on. I mean, this is it. I've... You know, I've called you to be an apostle, and, uh, and we've been through it together, and you've learned at the hand of masters. Now go. Now it's the time. And you get launched. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. And I like, I like his analogy here because I, I can identify with this very strongly because I'm willing. Lord, I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to do that. And I think all of us are. I mean, we're really willing. We're not sitting gritting our teeth and kind of hating the Lord and resenting the whole thing. We're, we're taking a shot at this thing. We want to, we you know, let's see something, Lord. Let's, uh, let's make something out of it. Let's, let's see you open the Red Sea and make my life worth something out of that which was not worth anything. So we all have this keen readiness to will. So he says, well, just as you had this, have this readiness of will, I want to see a performance also out of that which you have. So God likes to see the action follow on the heels of the willingness. And he asks for the performance of the doing of it. And one of the things that we reviewed um, a little earlier, uh, it's difficult to see a verse like this if our mind is blinded to the concept that God actually wants you to do things. That God wants a performance. He wants behavior. He wants, if, uh, if we can make the Christian life one of doctrine only and belief only, then, we, then there never needs to be the performance. And so correspondingly, this line that approaches us, that God has chosen to set, comes upon us unawares. Let's look at another... Uh, episode here in Acts chapter 24. This is uh, Felix. And uh, <clears throat> verse 24. Acts 24, 24. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he, being Paul, reasoned of righteousness and temperance in the judgment to come. Felix trembled. I mean, this is coming. I mean, this is down-home preaching, and it's scoring. Felix realizes, wow. But look what he does. Go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you. Don't make the mistake of saying, but Lord, I just bought a cow. I have lands that haven't been seen yet. I just got married. My father just passed away. Because that is the nature of life. It is never convenient. And when the will of God has come clear to you, you simply do it. But the temptation will be is, well, you know, gee, if I just had another hundred dollars in the bank, or if I wait till it stops raining, or wait till the relatives leave, or wait till the kids are out of school, and it goes on and on and on. There is no convenient season coming, and Felix missed it. He would have done better to respond to his trembling heart and say to Paul, Sir, what must I do to be saved? But, see, that's... That's carnality. That's the natural man that figures, well, yeah, I, I got the picture here, but I want to work some more moves. I'm not quite all that ready to be animated. 
Let's look at uh, some more. Second Corinthians uh, six two. Well, six one. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also, this is the Corinthian church Paul is talking to, that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now what does that mean, to receive the grace of God in vain? I thought you've had the grace of God. I mean, everything was just like downhill, you know, what's the old expression? Uh, have it by the tail on a downhill pull? Don't know where that came from, but uh, basically it means I've got it made. And that's how grace has been taught. Man, I've got it made. And Paul is warning the church, lest you receive the grace of God in vain. And the reason is because the grace of God is, is designed to bring a result. Like it says in Jude, um, now has the, uh, the grace of God appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live righteously and sober in this present world. Uh, you know, the, and the grace of God should teach us that we should deny ungodliness and live righteously and, uh, in, this, uh, in this ungodly world. And if it's not, then it's been no use, which is what vain means. It means it's not serving its purpose. But... In addition to that, if you see from the next verse, for he says, I have heard you in a time accepted. God decides if it's accepted by time. And in the day of salvation, I have succored you. Behold, now is the accepted time, like it was for Felix. That was his opportunity. Now is the day of salvation. And so that's why when grace is extended toward you in some form or another, and we do not occasion its reception so that it actually produces an effect for us so that our behavior changes, then we receive the grace of God in vain. And notice Paul argues that what happens is that we evidently don't understand that when the accepted time comes, it's present. It, it's like now. And we don't like that about the Lord. We, we would much rather have our religion a little more philosophical so that we can consider it when we please and uh, get enamored with the world when we please and we know we can always come back and, uh, and consider it again. But that is not a good characterization at all because God himself ordains a time that's acceptable to him. And as long as we're responding in that time, there's no problem. The problem occurs when we exceed that time. And notice how tenuous that is, because the Bible doesn't say you only have one day to get it right or one year. It's God who decides what that accepted time is. And that's why, you know, how it says, uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And one of the things we are persuaded of is that therefore we turn to the Lord and say, oh, Lord, I need to hear from you. And if, and if it's getting short, if time's getting short, I want to know. I don't want to fall asleep and then be overtaken by events. Warn me, because you say you will do nothing except you, uh, you tell your servants the prophets. And I'm your servant, Lord. Reveal to me just whether I'm being prudent, whether... Whether I am, uh, as we'll see in a second, redeeming the time. What, in fact, why don't we look at that? Ephesians uh, 5.12. I'd like to make an observation that perhaps will project what I feel is happening worldwide let's say over the next 10 or 20 or so years. Man in his attempt to excel in technology and in industry and in medicine and sciences and the arts and music 
is actually fragmenting our lives such that demands on your time are being made more than ever before. And it's deceiving because you would think, well, look, we now have an automobile. And, you know, look how much time we save. It used to be you'd have to walk from city to city. Well, it's deceiving because with this extra speed, we are enticed into using it. And in so doing, we are then bound to it. It becomes, it becomes a necessary part of living. And the tentacles of, uh, of a technological civilization, which the world is, is actually growing. And what you will find is that you are actually being denied time. You don't have more time than ever before. You have less time than ever before. Because this car that saves you so much time has to be, you have to put gas in it, you have to take care of it, it takes your money, and you've got to go work and get enough money to fix the car to go to work. And as this day, as this day proceeds in its madness, that is decidedly something that you will begin to notice to have, that will happen. And that is a, co a, a competitive spirit, a competitive drive that will demand your time. And it will slay you spiritually and physically too. Men's hearts shall fail them for fear in the days that are ahead. And I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I would not be surprised that we may have to do what Christians do in Russia now. And that is taking a stand in the Lord that will actually deny us the benefit of these things. Now, I can't be any clearer because I don't know. But I suspect that as the Christians have had to do in times past, that we are going to have to face this pull that, that has brought us into society. We, we are no longer at a place where, you know, the world has its TV, and so we use the TV for Jesus. You know, the world has its uh, money-raising schemes, and so we raise money for Jesus. That's okay for a season, and that, that season is going fast. And what is happening now is like what happened to the Jews in, uh, in Egypt under Pharaoh. See, there is another Pharaoh coming, and the spirit of that Pharaoh is already here. And it's like more brick more brick and no straw it's a madness and we all need to be alert to that and so this this idea I'm, I'm relating to uh, <clears throat> Ephesians 5:16 uh, redeeming the time for the days are evil the more evil the days the more important your regard for time is going to be because time is a limited resource. We all have identically 24 hours in a day. And every one of us spends that day every day perfectly. At the end of the day, you are out of time and you have another day. You can't save it up. All you can do is redeem it. All you can do is be effective with it. And the madness that is coming will make a tremendous demand on your time. Guard your time as a dog guards his bone. Don't you let anyone steal it. You, you proportion your time according as your best judgment dictates. And make sure you are giving time to the Lord. Make sure you are giving, of course we have to give time to uh, to earning a living, that, um, that takes a big chunk. We have to give time to rest. It's, <laughs> that's how God has made us. But there is a, a certain amount of discretionary time, and that is where your choices are going to come under some pressure in the days in which we're living now, if you haven't already felt it. Redeem the time. Don't, and one way you redeem the time is you, what you do, you do quickly. Just You get it done 
get right to it, tidy it up, and go on with serving the Lord. Don't try to parlay things in Jesus. Don't do it. Don't try to get this thing maneuvered and that. Usually when the Lord brings things to you, they are simple, and he just simply wants you to act, and it's, and it's done, and that's it. And then you go on to something else. Don't try to build the Christian life and try to get this with that and the other thing. The Christian life is simple. Remember how it says, For I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. And Jesus is not a pharaoh, this cruel taskmaster who has us doing about a million things all at once. Quite often it's just simple. He'll say, there's a brother in need. Speak a word of comfort to him. Just that. Just that. And so you do it. You don't say, well, I'm going to go to Bible school first so I can learn how to counsel a brother. You just do it. You say, Lord, I don't know how to do it. The Lord will say, I'll be in your mouth. That's how God leads. And don't let your Christian life become so complicated because it will, it will tie you up in knots. And when you have the time, by not redeeming it, you are then out of time. And I think I'm much encouraged by the Apostle Paul and, and by Jesus too. Actually, yeah, they, they both had the same characteristic. Jesus, while he was yet here on earth, said, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. He had time left over. Paul said, I finished my course. And he, this is when he's writing 2 Timothy. I finished my course. It's over, boys. I reached the end. He had time left over. Telling us that if we redeem the time, there isn't this mad panic. It's kind of like you arrive at the train station well before the train comes, rather than having to chase it down the track. That's an old commuter. Uh, I used to commute. and uh, You don't want to chase the train down the track, because it leaves on time. At least they used to. Titus 2.10. Uh, 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 and notice the next, and be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The two go hand in hand. And what we're proposing to you, in being reconciled to God, when he reveals his will concerning a sin or, or, um, or something that needs uh, uh, attention, you attend to it quickly. You don't have to panic. Because he provides you the time. He provides you plenty of what is necessary to respond. But don't spend it carelessly. Don't delay because what happens is that you, you develop a kind of a, a calloused sense of judgment as to how quickly time is moving. And time <laughs> moves more quickly than you are aware. And then time is out. Praise the Lord. We have a a technique we use with our children. If we say to them, we want this room cleaned up in 10 minutes, it doesn't get done. Because they know that, well, what's 10 minutes? I mean, they've got to look at their watch and they have to remember, and, you know, and they, they can just feel that it's too, uh, too soft. So what we do, we take a timer, a kitchen timer, and set it on 10 minutes. Say, and that thing, when that thing goes, I mean, it is indifferent to all appeals. <laughs> and wow, you ought to see him go. But that's how it is with the Lord. We get the feeling as though, wow, sure he says it, but you know. No, there is a place where he sets that kitchen timer and it's indifferent to appeal. And he just simply expects things to be done. Understand what the Lord's will is. Okay, we're almost done. Titus uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse uh, Titus, I'm in the wrong book here. Titus Philemon. Titus 2. Verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Not purloining, not delaying. When the master says, I want this bale moved from here to there, 
The servant says, yes, right away. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. And it also applies with our relationship with the Lord. Hebrews 3, verses uh, 7 and 8. <clears throat> Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the wilderness. The voice of the Lord needs to be heard at the time and responded to at the time. See, Israel, this is talking about Israel not entering into the land of promise. The emphasis here is not so much on the hearing. It's kind of like, it's not the hearing of the ear, it's the hearing of behavior. They didn't hear the Lord because they didn't follow him. They knew that they were called to go into the land. <coughs> they refused to do it. And isn't it interesting? That was their moment. He didn't say to them, now if you won't go into the land, I'll see to it that you don't. He just said, go into the land. And he made his own judgment that this, for them, was an appointed time. And they refused to go in. And Moses said, that's it. Because you've done this, you will not go in. Remember what the people did as soon as they heard that judgment? They said, oh, oh we're sorry. You know, here we go. And they were slaughtered. They were just one day too late. Just one day. They were all willing then. The problem was their time was gone. And unfortunately, the New Testament warns us about this Old Testament thing. In fact, it says, you know what? It happened to them to be an example to us. So the same thing won't happen to you. So don't gamble with the Lord. Don't say, I, I, I know he told me that I'm going to put away all lying and evil speaking. But because there'll come a day when the Lord says, the kitchen timer has gone off. You're a day late. And it doesn't count. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart. And that's how we err. We err in our heart. And they have not known my ways. And that's our problem too. So I swore in my wrath, this got him angry. A lot of stuff he overlooked. This angered him. They will not enter into my rest. And this sixth day of, of the Lord is the step just prior to entering into the rest of God. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort at one another daily while it's called today. That's the short accounts. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, that's what happens when, when you don't act promptly, you get to be calloused. And you just feel like you've got it made. You feel like, I know I can build that barn. You run out of time. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, 
Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And if you go down to verse 7, it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Because, and it says two verses later, there remains therefore a rest to the people of God. Praise the Lord. Let's um, look at one, uh, one more. In Revelation 2.21, it's, it's one we saw before, and then we'll close. <clears throat> Let's go back to verse 20, Revelations 2.20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, because you suffered that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. God determined an interval clearly showing if she had changed her mind during that time, he would not have assessed the penalty. She did not, so he assessed the penalty. And what was her penalty? Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Praise the Lord. So don't delay. When the Lord shows you, Keep a tidy account with the Lord. Don't let your Christian life get so complicated with unresolved issues before the Lord. Saying, now, Lord, clearly show.